we just sang, I cannot tell how he will win the nations. And in our story this evening, we'll uh, be able to see some way that God does, in fact, reach the nations, how he will win the nations. Our story in 2 Kings 5, you may like to turn to it if you've got it with you, uh, is the story of Naaman, this great general in the Aramean army, and his encounter with the man of God, Elisha. So it comes in this, the midst of the story of Elisha. You may remember that as Israel declined in its history from the glory days of David, then Solomon, and then the nation being split into two, Judah in the south, Israel in the north, uh, and then there's a string of kings, some of them not so good, not so bad in the south, all of them w not good, all of them bad in the south, all of them sinful, all of them going away from God. And during that time then, God raises up uh, prophets, men of God, to be his spokespeople to uh, the people of God to call them back to the Lord. The great one who came first, Elijah, is followed then by Elisha, who in many ways is even greater. Uh, and this is in the story of Elisha. And in this story then we find out that Naaman, the commander of the king of Aram, was a great man in the sight of his master and is highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. That is modern day Syria, capital in Damascus. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now, the people of God at this time suffered from spiritual disease, spiritual malaise. And we can see in the build-up to this story, and even in the story itself, some, some, some symptoms. So just by way of introduction here, uh, a few symptoms of spiritual disease or spiritual malaise that the people of God here suffered um, just to set the scene, really, for the story uh, and from what we can learn from God's interaction through Elisha with Naaman, this uh, Gentile outsider. Well, the first is that they had no expectation for God to be actively involved in their lives. No expectation. So when Joram receives this message from the king of Aram, uh, King Joram of Israel, he's the king of the people of God in Israel, but he has no expectation for God to do anything at all in his life. So when he receives this message, he tears his clothes. He thinks, how can I do such a thing as restore this army commander, this enemy commander, to good health? Uh, of course, that is not exactly what the little girl said, is it, to uh, Naaman's wife. She said that there is a prophet in Israel. If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. But as kings often do, they will only speak to their opposite number at the same rank. And so he thought the best thing to do was to send uh, Naaman off to the king in Israel. And Joram thinks that he's just trying to pick a fight with him because he realizes that he can't do such a thing as heal somebody from leprosy. Uh, and so he, uh, he gets angry and annoyed uh, and upset. Now, in his instructions to the people of Israel... God said to the people of Israel, as they were going to go into the promised land, he says through Moses that uh, he, he, he tells them what would happen if they turned away from God. And one of the things that they're told that is this, they would be routed by their enemies. Instead of having 10 soldiers who rout 100 of the enemies, it'll be 10 soldiers from the enemies who rout 100 of their own soldiers. That's what will happen if they turn away from God. It was a symptom then that they were in spiritual malaise, that they were spiritually unwell. Their hearts uh, were diseased, their spirits were diseased. That they were being oppressed, it was a symptom then, that they were being oppressed by this foreign power of Aram. Moses says to them that if they were to repent from their sin and turn back to him, he would restore them. But in this story... King Joram makes no such move to God, does he? The people of Israel make no such move to God. So Joram is distressed on receiving this letter. You see that in verse 7. Uh, and he replies in, in that way, can I kill and bring back to life? Well, no, Joram, you can't, but God can. 
But he doesn't think about God, does he? Such is his life. It's only being lived on the horizontal. Now, Paul told the Corinthians that spiritual truth is only understood by spiritual people, by people who are spiritually alive. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And Joram demonstrates that he is unspiritual by his reaction. So that's the, that's just, this is by way of introduction there. This is the first symptom, if you like, of the spiritual malaise among the people of God. The second is exemplified in this servant of God, Gehazi. You see him? Uh, he's been the servant of the man of God. There is Elisha, and he's got Gehazi as his servant. Uh, Gehazi has seen him do remarkable miracles. And yet Gehazi's religion is mere formality. You see that, uh, you see that in verse 20. See how he, uh, how he speaks to Naaman. Gehazi, uh, Naaman had traveled some distance. Gehazi said to himself, my master uh, was too easy on Naaman this Aramean by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. Where did he get that expression, as surely as the Lord lives? Have a look in verse 16. What the prophet says, as surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. So Gehazi had learned religious language, phrases. You know, sometimes we can be guilty of that, just using phrases when our hearts are not in it. That was true of Gehazi, wasn't it? His religion then had, was merely formal. It wasn't true spirituality. Uh, and it's often the, th the case that religion or spirituality or whatever you like to call it is often the last thing to change when a culture changes. Uh, and that you can tell so sometimes what a past was like by seeing people's religious reflections or the way that they go about their spiritual lives. Uh, I'll give an example of this. When I was in Nepal, uh, I came across the custom of tying the cat Biralo bandne, uh, and it was an expression that Nepalis used to use uh, about tying the cat. Uh, and it's true that in some rituals, Brahmin priests will always find a cat and tie it to the fence nearby. And when asked why they do that, they say, it's, "We've always done that. It's part of the ritual." Uh, and as they ask the story, then it turns out that one time a cat was walking across the holy place. And so they had to tie it up to make sure that it didn't do that in the future. And so they'd taken this very practical solution to a problem, and it had become a ritual in there among all of the other rituals they use. Uh, and so Nepalis use that as an expression of tying the cat. It's a mere ritual. It has no meaning at all. Now, it's as well for us to think about our own lives. Do we go through rituals just for the sake of it? Because if we do, like Gehazi, uttering those phrases, doing the right thing when their hearts are not in it, it's a sure sign of spiritual decay or even of no life at all. Well, another reason uh, that, or, or another feature of their, of their spiritual malaise is, again, found in Gehazi. He's a typical Israelite. He knows nothing of the gospel in his life right now because he doesn't appreciate God's grace. His reaction to Elijah's, Eli, Elisha's dealing with Naaman, see how he reacts. He thinks God has been too easy on him. My master was too easy on Naaman. Verse 20, do you see that? He doesn't recognize that God himself loves to be easy on people. He loves to give grace. Now, sometimes uh, people have that uh, attitude that somehow it's got to be difficult for people to be true believers or to live a, a truly spiritual life uh, and that God makes it difficult and we've got to, be rec we've got to recognize that and be ready to do difficult things for God. And they, they forget then that God is gracious. God comes in his grace to give new life to people and he enables us by his grace to live spiritual lives. 
So the Lord was not too easy on Naaman because he was not expecting Naaman to do something in order to receive his grace. But Gehazi didn't understand that. He didn't appreciate grace at all. So that's another way that we can see this spiritual malaise in the people of Israel. Uh, but another way then is to see how, and I mentioned it already, that God judges his people for turning away from him. Verse 1, it says that the Lord had given victory to Aram. Did you see that? The Lord had given victory to Aram. Israel, this nation that was supposed to be representing God to all the nations around, was supposed to be a glorious nation, was supposed to be a victorious nation, was supposed to be a magnanimous nation to the nations around, that others would want to come to Israel to be among the people they were being oppressed because they had turned away from God. And God was allowing, in fact, God was giving victory to the enemies, or, uh, to the enemies of Israel because they had turned away from him. It was a sign then of their spiritual malaise. Now, God chastens his people in response to the things that we do. How do you feel when you are chastened, when you are disciplined by the Lord? We all go through disciplines, uh, disciplined by the Lord. Sometimes it's difficult. Maybe it's a physical ailment or maybe it's some other difficulty. But God may be prompting us. He may be prompting us to think about our own lives. Am I living the life that God wants me to live? Somebody wrote years ago a, a book called The Mystery of God's Providence, The Mystery of Providence. And sometimes it is a mystery. We can't figure out exactly why we go through the things that we go through. But God takes us through those things for a purpose. And sometimes it's because we have turned away from him and he's giving us warnings so that we might realize that our, that our lives are not in line with God's and so that we might turn back to him and be restored to a right relationship to him. Is that the case with you? Or is it that the Lord is using those difficulties to train you and to hone you and to make you more useful for him and to make you more fit for his kingdom? It's not easy to interpret. Sometimes we can't interpret God's ways in our lives, but we should always be open to recognize that God is dealing in our lives. And in this case, these Israelites were being subject to oppression by their neighbors because of their spiritual decline. Uh, and it's true, isn't it, that righteous people are caught up in the judgment of God. And that's what we see in this young girl. This, this young girl, verses 2 and 3, they took captive a young girl from Israel and she served Naaman's wife. Now, what did she do to deserve that? Nothing. She was just a young girl. But her nation had gone against God and she got caught up in that. And so there she is. She gets abducted, taken away from her village, taken to a foreign land and made to serve the, uh, the wife of Naaman. But what is her reaction? It's so beautiful, isn't it? Perhaps some of you remember a message I preached on this some time ago. If only my master would see the prophet in, who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. She's a spiritual girl. Even the youngest among us can be, a, can be spiritual people. Uh, recognizing when God is at work, even in, my dif even in the difficult circumstances of my life, and that he can use me in the midst of that to, uh, to awaken people to their need of God and to show them the way. How do you react when things seem to go wrong in your life? Let this girl be a great example to you. Well, that's all by way of introduction, setting the scene. Here is the, uh, here is the scene. The people of God are, uh, are in spiritual decline and God sends this army to oppress them. Uh, and what, meanwhile, Naaman has leprosy and uh, this little girl tells him if only he would uh, go to this prophet in Samaria, he could be cured. Well, four steps then that God takes to bring an outsider to himself. Four steps that God takes to bring an outsider to himself. And the first is this, God awakens. God awakens. God awakens in Naaman a recognition of his need of him. 
That's what we see there in verse 1. Here is this great soldier. Can you imagine? He would have been the, the, the best athlete in his school. Uh, and now he's joined the army and he goes up through the ranks. And finally, uh, uh, but after not too long, he's the chief of staff of the army. This, he's trusted in, implicitly by the king. He can't put a foot wrong. But then we find, although he was a valiant soldier, he had leprosy. That, as you can see, many of you have uh, uh, notes on the bottom of your page. It may not be exactly the same as the modern disease of, of leprosy that we have today. But still, it's leprosy. And that's an important, there's an important point here why it was leprosy that Naaman, have, that Naaman has. Because leprosy in the Old Testament has a spiritual and a ritual meaning. It wasn't just a disease. You may remember that in the book of Leviticus, the third book in the Old Testament, uh, the people of Israel are given instructions on how to deal with somebody who is found to have leprosy. Somebody's then bathing and they see a little suspicious patch on their skin uh, and it won't go away and they think, what do I do with this? Then the instruction was, don't go to the doctor. There's no cure for leprosy. But go to the priest, the one who is designated to represent you to God. And if the priest determined that indeed it was infectious, the person was pronounced unclean and sent out of the camp. He had to wear torn clothes. He had to let his hair be unkempt as if somebody had died. And he had to cover the lower part of his face and cry out, unclean, unclean, everywhere he went. It was a terrible thing then to contract such a disease. And it's a figure of sin in the, in the Bible. You were cut off from all the blessings that were intended for the people of God. Now here is Naaman, this great man, but he's awakened to his need by uh, God giving him this leprosy. He has all the strength and all the power, and yet now he has an incurable disease. That's the first thing then. God awakens somebody to their need of him. And the second is that God sends. God sends a messenger to tell them the good news. In this case, this little girl is taken, abducted and taken away to be uh, a servant in his household. Now, why should Naaman raid that particular village and take away that particular girl to be his wife's servant? That's God's purposes, isn't it? That God had his purposes to bring that particular girl into that particular situation so that he should hear from that girl, who is a spiritual girl, that there is a prophet in Israel who can cure him of his leprosy. So here is that little girl, this true child of God, who recognizes in, uh, in the circumstances of her life that her place in God's plan is, is crucial for what he wants to do in the lives of the people that, he's been, that she's been sent among. And she's close enough to her God to realize that she can make a difference in her situation for his glory. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us that God saves people by bringing somebody across his path to preach to him. You remember that Paul said, I've determined to do nothing except preach Christ and him crucified. It was important that he preach. Uh, and also, likewise, in Romans, in, in his letter to the Romans, he says this, Romans 10. How can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So the preaching of the gospel, that is the, the spoken word, is crucial for this man's life. And it's crucial for anybody to be made right with God. You may have heard the expression, preach the gospel always and use words if necessary. Well, men and women, that is completely inadequate because there is no such thing as preaching the gospel without words. 
We can demonstrate the gospel through our lives without our words. But without words, people cannot know the truth. There's, there is a reason why Jesus is called the word of God, isn't it? That he then embodies the communicated word, the spoken word from God to mankind. And there is a reason then we are given the ability to, to speak truth to people's lives. And this girl makes use of that and speaks words of truth to her mistress so this man can uh, be rescued and saved from his leprosy. So, God awakens and God sends. Thirdly, God humbles. See how God humbles this man in order that he might be saved. Verse 5, by all means go, the king of Aram says. I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. Uh, so Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. An enormous amount. It would have taken probably several camels to be able to carry all this loot uh, to Israel to be able to pay for his healing. He's a proud man. He's a self-made man. He's never got anywhere by virtue of a gift. He's always earned his way. And now he wants to earn his way to get a healing. He's a proud man. But God humbles him. See that in verses 11. Uh, uh, well, we'll go up to verse 10. Elisha sent a messenger to him. Notice that Naaman comes to the door and Elisha doesn't even go to the door. You think, well, it's a bit rude, isn't it? But Elisha does that for a reason. He wants this great and proud man to realize that Elisha, as God's servant, is not at his beck and call. So he sends his, mess, his servants to the door. And the servant says, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, his home, better than all the waters of Israel? He's bombastic, isn't he, in his expressions. Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. There he is, going off in a huff. And his servants thinking, oh boy, what have we got to do now to convince him? And so they have a quiet word to him. And he turns around. And he humbles himself. And he goes into the river. There is this great Aramean commander in all his finery, with all his, his riches uh, and all his servants and all his soldiers with him. And he has to go into the river and he humbles himself. Now God always humbles people when he calls them to himself. There is no place for us to think that somehow we can God come to God on our terms. No, we have to come to God on God's terms. So that's the third thing, God humbles. And fourthly, God provides. God graciously provides a way of salvation. And that's what is pictured here in this instruction to Naaman to go and wash in the river. Now, in order to understand the significance of that action... It's important that we go back to the law of God and see how God originally told the people of Israel to deal with, se with, with leprosy. Now, I've already uh, described that a little bit, but now what if you have leprosy? How do you get back into the people of God? How can you be restored to the people of God if you have leprosy? You may be washing one day then, or you have leprosy, and it seems to be getting better. Now, you have to go then to, back to the priest to be re-included among the people of God. The impurity of leprosy was never considered permanent, but it only lasted as long as the disease. While you got leprosy, you were unclean. You had to be outside. You had to be outside of the people of God. But if the disease then finished, you were allowed to be included again among the people of God. So if a sufferer somehow got well from his disease, he could be checked by the priest and then go through a number of rituals. Now the center point of those rituals was this. 
the sprinkling of the person with sacrificial water. First, a clean bird would be taken, such as a dove. Uh, a dove can be one of the birds that can be sacrificed. The dove is then sacrificed over a pot of water. The blood comes into the pot. Then another live bird is brought along with a piece of cedar wood, some scarlet yarn, and a hyssop twig. And the priest would dip the bird with the other materials into the, the water and blood mixture and then sprinkle it over the leprosy patient who, is, who has become well. Sprinkle them seven times with that bloody water. The person is already clean. They're already uh, healed from the leprosy. So this is a ritual cleansing. By this ritual then, the person is accepted once again into the people of God and into the presence of God in worship. Until that happens, you can't even worship God. You can't approach God. You can't come into the city of God. You can't come into the temple. You cannot be a beneficiary of God's blessing. But with that ritual, you are included again among the people of God. So it signifies moral and spiritual cleansing. You'll remember what... Um, David says in Psalm 51, he says, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He's got something like that in his mind as he says that. And then again, he says uh, that ritual, he recognizes that ritual cleansing is not enough. So he says uh, in verse six, he says, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me, have I got the right place? <laughs> no. Uh, can't remember. Anyway, there it is. Uh, somewhere there. Surely you desire truth in the inmost parts. It's there somewhere. <laughs> you teach me wisdom in the inmost place. God is speaking to David. David recognizes it's not just about ritual. In fact, actual ritual is just the picture of the reality, the spiritual reality that has to happen in the heart. So, Elisha, though, doesn't require Naaman to go through all the Levitical rules. Why not? Because he's not part of the people of God. He doesn't need to be included among the people of God in the same way as the Israelites did. And neither is he uh, yet clean of his leprosy. So instead, Elisha performs a miracle for Naaman. But neither does that mean that he is disconnected to the Levitical law. So Elisha says, go through this ceremony of ritual cleansing. And you notice that it's seven times he has to dip himself in the River Jordan. But why the River Jordan? What's the significance of that river? You'll remember then that it's that river through which the people of God had to enter into the promised land. God's land. Naaman, as a foreigner then, was to join the people of God by passing through the Jordan River. Hundreds of years later, another prophet, John the Baptist, came to the River Jordan. People went out to him to be baptized. The link is made then between the Old Testament event of Naaman's bathing and that given by John. And the people recognized it as a baptism of repentance. And when Jesus came to be baptized by John, he says this, it is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. So the ritual cleansing in the Jordan had become part of the Old Testament law uh, uh, um, so that in order for Jesus to fulfill that, he too had to go through that ritual cleansing in the river. And Jesus fulfills that purpose of God uh, in his life and death on the cross. And John tells us something very significant about Jesus' baptism. The reason he came baptizing with water was so that Christ might be revealed to Israel. So when the Lord Jesus passed through the waters, heaven was opened and the Spirit of God descended like a dove and lighted on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased now two more things to finish with before I finish two postscripts if you like 
two features of this story that I want to deal with before we come to an end. And that is, the first is this, Naaman's strange requests in verses 17 to 19a. You see that? Naaman makes, uh, he, he makes to return to Adam, to, to Aram, rather, to, to, Bas- to Damascus. Uh, and he makes a request of Elisha. Uh, he says, um, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. That's the first request he makes. Naaman recognizes that there's something special about the land of the covenant community. So he requests enough soil for a pair of mules to carry back to his home, no doubt so that he can make a little mound there in his back garden, build an altar onto it, and offer sacrifices to the Lord there. And it's strange, isn't it? Elisha doesn't say, oh no, you mustn't do that. That's not part of the law. Only the priests are allowed to do it, and they're only allowed to do that in Jerusalem. He doesn't say that. He allows him to go. He takes it. Don't forget, Naaman is not part of the people of Israel. And yet he has come to the people of Israel and he's come to the the spokesman of God, the the man of God. He's come to faith through that message that he's given to him. And now he wants to go back home. And he's sent home by Elisha and he takes this soil with him because it's so precious to him now, the soil of of the land of God. So you might think that that's nothing but superstition. But that's not the way that Elisha responds to it, is it? There is a time to speak, to teach spiritual truth. But that was not the time. And Elisha was content to let Naaman fill up his mule sacks and go off back to Aram. There is something special about Israel's soil. One day, the saviour of the world would be walking on that soil up and down the land of Israel. And he would be the saviour, not only of the people of Israel, but also of the Arameans, and also of the Babylonians, and also of the Persians, and the Greeks, and the Romans, and the Brits, and the Indians, and the Chinese. But I wonder if we can learn a lesson for ourselves too. I'm particularly thinking about those of you who are parents. Children are inquisitive, aren't they? They ask difficult questions. But we need to realize that not all spiritual truth can be apprehended by the mind of a child. So we must be careful that we don't overload our children with doctrine or theology. And the same is true then of an adult who takes an interest in Christ. They may have many questions. It's not necessary then to try to answer every question immediately or to load them down with difficult truths when what they need is spiritual milk. And when they, have, uh, when they become disciples of Jesus, they may have more questions, but they need to walk before they can run. And so we need to choose our moments when we teach. Let us look for those teachable moments. Now, the second request, which is equally perhaps puzzling for Naaman, is this. He says, but may the Lord, verse 18, forgive your servant for this one thing, When my master enters the temple of Rimmon, that's the false god, which has been the god of Naaman up to now. When my master enters the temple of Rimmon to bow down and he's leaning on my arm and I have to bow down there also. When I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Notice the repetition there. Naaman wants to make it clear, or the writer wants to make it clear, that this is, he wants to make sure Elisha understands what is going on. I'm going to go into that temple before a false god, and I am going to bow down. He says, may I be forgiven of that. Why? Because his heart's not in it. He's there because he's the commander-in-chief of the army. And when the king goes in, he expects to lean on uh, Naaman's arm. And so Naaman has to bow down while the king is bowing down. But his heart is not in it. And what does Elisha say? Go in peace. Peace, shalom. Completeness, soundness, peace, contentment. That's what he says to Naaman. Go in peace. Now, we can apply that 
today in our relations with other believers, I think. They may be in our church or in other gospel churches and they make decisions with which we are uncomfortable. Think of a doctor and the decisions they have to make. Or or think of a believer who gets a job in a pub, let's say. Or think of a student who's trying to make friends at university and they're invited out to a nightclub. They might make a decision that's different from the one that you make. Paul says in his letter to the Romans, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, they stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. So that's my first postscript, if you like. And secondly, Gehazi's greed. That's the last part of the story then. Here, here is Gehazi. He thinks Elisha has been too easy on Naaman and he thinks here's an opportunity to get rich so he runs after Naaman and says oh he thinks up a story doesn't he he tells them the story people have arrived we need some uh, money to be able to give them hospitality Uh, and he says well you know (laughs) a talent of silver he says take two talents so there he goes with 34 kilos of silver it's supposed to be comic I think This is way more than he could possibly use. And there are these two servants carrying these sacks of silver and clothes ahead of Gehazi uh, while he walks back to his accommodation. He puts it all there in the house. And then Gehazi stands before Elisha. And Elisha knows exactly what's happened. Well, there's no sign of Gehazi's humbling, is there? It's a moving and sober story. Gehazi is struck with the leprosy that Naaman had been struck with. But there's no sign that he humbles himself before the Lord like Naaman did. Instead, he goes off. And as far as we know, he's struck with that for the rest of his life. Now that is a, a sobering story because it reminds us this lesson. That nearness to grace is not grace. And I mean by that, that you can be close to the kingdom. You can be almost a Christian. You can be so close that you're coming to church every week. That you're coming to prayer meeting. That you're going to home home groups. That you're reading the Bible every day. That you're praying every day. And yet, if you've not experienced the grace of Christ in your life, you're not there. You've not experienced grace. You're not part of the covenant people of God. Just like it would seem was the situation with Gehazi. There he was, the servant of the great man of God. He'd seen people raised from the dead. And yet his heart was full of greed rather than humility as it should have been. May that be not true of any of us this evening. So to conclude then. The story of Naaman's conversion then directs us to the one who would come and provide a perfect way of salvation through the washing of his uh, his blood that was shed on the cross. Naaman was saved by Christ and that's how you also and I also may be saved. So have you come to see your need of him? Have you heard the good news of Jesus? Have you recognized that there is nothing you can do for your salvation? Have you trusted in Jesus' cleansing work for your forgiveness and your acceptance by God? Well, may God make that true for all of us. Amen.